for joining us today for our Missouri Trailblazers program on Laura Ingalls Wilder, brought to you today by the Missouri State Museum. My name is Pam Stone, and I'm the Senior Associate here at the Holt Summit Public Library, which is a branch of the Daniel Boone Regional Library. Joining me today is Lauren Williams, who is the Adult and Community Services Manager for the Daniel Boone Regional Library. Okay, let's get started. Today's program is the fifth installment of our Missouri Trailblazer series on the third Tuesday of each month at 1 p.m. From now through August, the Missouri State Museum staff will present a variety of virtual and lunch, virtual lunch and learn programs featuring trailblazers who have impacted Missouri's thought through major events, leadership, innovation, and more. I want to say a special thank you to our partnership with the Missouri State Museum for organizing these presentations. I will now turn things over to Angela Wells, who is the Education Specialist for the Missouri State Museum located in Jefferson City, Missouri. Angela, would you like to say a few words about what's going on at the museum? Yeah, um, so thank you everyone for joining us for today's Trailblazers program. This actually goes along with our exhibit right now, the Trailblazers exhibit, which you can come and see at the museum. We also have a hooked rug exhibit, which will be available to view through June. Um, and we also have our memory in cloth exhibit, which showcases um, flags from areas all around the state. Um, I just wanna add that we really encourage people to visit the museum, which is on the first floor of the Missouri State Capitol building. Our hours are eight to five, Monday through Friday and nine to four, Saturday and Sunday. Back to you, Pam. Thank you, Angela. Today's program is about Laura Ingalls Wilder. This afternoon, we are joined by Anna Offit. I enjoyed Anna's version of her bio so much, I would like to share it. I am Anna Offit, an interpretive service specialist with the Missouri State Museum. Or very simply, I am a tour guide at the museum where I, share, where I share our beautiful Missouri State Capitol with visitors from all over the country and many foreign countries. I have been with the museum for over 15 years. Before coming to the State Museum, I was an elementary librarian, media specialist for the Jefferson City Public Schools for 30 years. Thank you all for being here. And now I'll turn things over to Anna. Anna. And you're good to speak. Okay. Well, we're not going to start this yet. If you want to introduce yourself at all, or okay. I'm going to start the share screen. Okay, although Laura Ingalls Wilder was not born in Missouri, she certainly can be considered an important trailblazer for her contributions to educational and inspirational literature for Missouri farm folks many years before she even wrote her first Little House book. As we consider her life and work, we maybe also see her life as a child, a teenager, and adult, and had many challenges that seemed insurmountable just as challenges many people have faced in 2020 and 2021 with the unexpected pandemic. Two favorite sayings passed down to Laura and her sisters were, there's nothing new under the sun and life goes on. I think we really remember that, need to think about that today. That can be said of her life and ours too. I don't know about you, but when I read the Little House books, I hear Laura speaking as a child and then perhaps changing as she gets older. Laura began the Little House books in 1932 when she was already 65 years old and finished the last one in 1943 when she was 76 years old. She explained that she wrote from a combination of several sources, her memory, stories Ma and Pa told her and research she did in South Dakota when she returned for a visit when she was 64. Um, oh. 
Okay. Uh, this is before the Little House books. Pa, Charles Ingalls, grew up in New York. He was a hard worker, played a fiddle, and dreamed big dreams. Ma, Caroline Quiner, was born in Wisconsin, probably the first non-Indian baby born in the Milwaukee area. She was a school teacher, a calm and gentle person. Mary was born in 1865 in Pepin, Wisconsin. Laura was born in 1867 in Pepin, Wisconsin. The family left Wisconsin to move to Indian Territory because Wisconsin was becoming too crowded for Pa. The frontier had moved west of the Mississippi River and Pa wanted to move west too. We'll talk first about the little house on the prairie, the Indian Territory. The family moved to Kansas when Laura was two years old. <clears throat> Pa was searching for good land, a creek nearby for both water and trees that could be harvested for lumber. This was 13 miles beyond the Verdigree River near Independence, Kansas. Without realizing it, Pa had, almost, had chosen land given to the Osage Indians by the US government. The family arrived while the Indians were on a hunting trip and no one was on their land. Pa showed Laura and Mary Indian beads and campfire sites the Indians left behind. When the Osages returned and found white settlers on their land, they were understandably upset. Instead of the white settlers having to give up and move, to, and move the government offered the Indians less than a quarter per acre to give up and move to reservations in Oklahoma. The Indians felt this was not right and not enough to be paid. So they held powwows and chanted long into the night for some time, a frightening experience for the settlers, especially children. Eventually the government offered the Osages a dollar and 25 cents per acre and an agreement that they moved to reservations in Oklahoma. The Osage Indians, eventually moved to Oklahoma instead of fighting for their land. This was in 1870. While in Indian territory, the family came down with what they called fever and og during hot weather. They uh, suffered from chills, fevers and aches diagnosed as malaria. They were treated by Dr. George A. Tan, a pioneer neighbor who happened to be an Afro-American. Carrie was born August 3rd, 1870. What hardships did they face? Many, but a couple would have been malaria and living on the Osage land. Little house in the big woods. Well, they went back to Wisconsin. Note here, uh, this book actually covers the life both kind of before and after Little House on the Prairie. When Laura was four years old in 1871, they moved back to Wisconsin because of the man who bought their land there wanted them to take it back. Laura remembered that it was at this time that she discovered her love of reading. Both Ma and Pa were great readers and I read a lot at home with them, she said. Pa farmed their land for two years, but he constantly grumbled about the growing, the roots that kept coming up in his cleared fields. He had liked the Kansas prairie and wanted to live on the prairie again. He sold the farm again and the family moved to Wisconsin. <laughs> what hardship? Well, maybe sprouting trees in their, in their land. So we go to On the Banks of Plum Creek, the winter of 1873. They moved to Minnesota on Laura's birthday, sixth birthday in fact, while the Mississippi River was frozen and crossing was e easier and safer. They heard the ice splitting the night after their safe crossing. They settled in Walnut Grove, Minnesota in a dugout with sod walls, a roof of willow boughs with strips of sod laid on top of them. The roof was covered with grass with stove pipes sticking up through the grass. Mary and Laura attended school in Walnut Grove. A highlight was the school had a blackboard, literally a board painted black. Laura had chores each day, including walking the cow to pasture each morning and back to the barn at night. She also had to help with sewing, gardening, cooking, and watching Carrie. 
Paul planned to raise wheat that could be shipped by rail to the flour mills in St. Paul, Minnesota. But before the harvest of 1875, grasshoppers struck in droves and destroyed all vegetation, ruining crops, gardens, everything green. Because the crops were destroyed and they needed money, Paul walked 200 miles further east to find work on a farm. November 1st, 1875, baby brother Freddie was born. In 1876, crops again failed because the grasshopper larva hatch, hatched and destroyed the crops. August 27, 1876, Freddie died. This was such a difficult time for the family that Laura never once mentioned Freddie in her books. That fall, they returned to the Burr Oak, moved to Burr Oak, Iowa, where Paul managed a hotel. While they were in Burr Oak, Ma did the laundry, cooking, and cleaning for the hotel, and Laura and Mary waited tables and washed dishes. May 23, 1877, Grace was born in Burr Oak, Iowa. They moved back to Walnut Grove in the fall of 1877. Pa built a small house for the family and opened a butcher shop for income. Laura worked in a hotel after the school term ended in the summer of 1878. In the spring of 1879, when Laura was 12, Mary got sick with severe pain in her head and a high fever. A Dr. Hoyt cared for her, but it appeared that she would not live. Pa sent for a Dr. Wellcome, and it's W-E-L-L-C-O-M-E, to come by train from Sleepy Eye. His diagnosis was brain fever, meaning that the nerves in her eyes were dying. Today, she might be diagnosed as viral men meningoencephalitis. Mary was left blind from that, this disease. This was when Paul gave Laura the duty of becoming Mary's eyes, describing things to her because Laura, and because Laura learned to describe things in detail, she believed this helped her later as a writer. What hardships? Many. Scarlet fever, Mary's blindness, the grasshopper plague, the baby boy Freddie dying. And from this time until Laura finished the little house books, the family struggled to find ways to pay for Mary's training at a school for the deaf in Benton, Iowa. Pa's sister, Aunt Dosha, came to offer Pa a job managing a railroad crew in Dakota Territory. The pay was $50 a month, a very appealing salary. Ma agreed to go along as that was their last move. It really did turn out to be the last long move for Ma and Pa, except when they moved from the country into the Smet years later. Pa went ahead of Ma and the girls and they followed going partway by train, a new and adventurous trip for the girls. Pa met them at Tracy, Minnesota with a wagon that was, that was in 1879. The family stayed in a surveyor's house the railroad owned that winter. Men wanting to uh, stake claims for homesteads stayed at their home house at night. Ma and the girls cooked, cleaned, and washed bedding and, and earned money for their overnight boarders and the meals. They earned $15, a very good income at that time. In February of 1880, Paul filed a claim for 160 acres in Kingsbury County near where DeSmet was later established. This was near where the Ingalls family had spent the previous winter. Never mind. <laughs> Paul also uh, bought two lots in the Smet, intending to sell one as a store. But the family first lived in it during the winter described in The Long Winter, the story of events in 1880 and 81. The family moved to their homestead at first where Paul built a shanty and a stable, dug a well, and broke the deeply rooted gra prairie grass and planted wheat. The Ingalls had their homestead and the future looked bright, except. But what hardships did they have? The main hardship I would say before the long winter was a lot of hard work. In the long winter, an old Indian warned about impending blizzards, which in fact did occur. He actually made this warning in October of 1880. 
The first blizzard occurred and the family moved to their store in town where one blizzard followed another until 15 foot drifts filled the town. School closed for the season. Uh, railroad tracks were buried in tra so trains could not get through. This net was cut off from the outside world for six months. Stores sold out of everything, flour, meat, wheat, and coal. The wind howled and shook the house. The temperature dropped as low as 40 degrees below zero often. When their coal was nearly gone, gone Paul went to their homestead and hauled in loads of hay, which he and Laura twisted and braided tightly into sticks so it would not burn too fast. This was an every single day task that required hours of hard work, which made their hands raw and sore. Food was also a problem. The family ate potatoes and biscuits made from flour and water until the flour ran out. Then Ma ground wheat in a coffee grinder to mix with the water. Ma ground wheat, yes, I said wheat, didn't I? When the wheat was gone, the family was nearly starving. The long winter goes into detail about a trip made by Almanzo Wilder and Cap Garland to get wheat for the townspeople. They made a one day trip across the open prairie in a sleigh to get wheat they were not really even sure existed. They bought 60 bushels of wheat that lasted the rest of the winter and provided enough food that the people survived. After having lived and survived this horrible winter, Laura realized she liked living in town. School opened again and Laura was an excellent student. At night, Laura taught Mary what she had learned at school because of course, Mary's blindness kept her home. What hardships did they have? Well, near starvation, extreme cold, being cut off from their neighbors, even across the street. Um, one picture is missing here of the little town on the prairie book. So <laughs> I'm going to go on to these happy golden years. We cover both books. Yes, we cover the, the subjects in both books, but you don't, you miss a picture. When Laura was 15, she was offered a job teaching school about 12 miles away. She took the job, which paid $40 for eight weeks of school. She had to live with Louis Bouchy's family the man who had actually offered her the job. She had five students, some older than she was, and they were rude. Also, Mr. Bouchy's wife was rude and the Bouchy's often fought and disagreed. It was at this time that Laura and Almanzo Wilder became friends because he came every Friday during the school term to drive her home to her family in his horse-drawn sleigh. He was 10 years older than Laura and she thought of him as Mr. Wilder. At this time, she did not see him as a boyfriend. He might've had a different idea. After her school ended, Laura returned to school in the SMET as a student. Laura went back and forth from being a student to being a teacher for three years. Her earnings were used to help pay for Mary to attend a school for the blind in Vinton, Iowa. It was during this time that Laura and Almanzo grew close, sharing their mutual love of the prairie talking for hours as they gathered wildflowers. Almanzo had grown up in upper New York state, but moved to Dakota territory where he bought a homestead and proved up on it, meaning it was his. In other words, he had to prove that he could clear the land, successfully grow crops and build a house. He owned a pair of beautiful Morgan horses, the finest for miles around, and they also caught all the girl's eye. Laura and Almanzo were married August 25th, 1885, when Laura was 18. However, before their wedding, Laura insisted that the minister not use the phrase, obey your husband, in the wedding vows. Laura was staying true to her independent and strong-willed self. And apparently, Almanzo did not object to the change in their wedding vows. What problems did they face during all this time? Loneliness while living with the Bouchy she did during her teaching time, deal, learning to deal with disrespectful students who were often older than she was, to name a few. Okay, then we have the first four years. Their daughter Rose was born December 5th, 1886. 
They owned two, 320 acres of good fertile soil, but fire destroyed their house. Hail and drought ruined their crops, and Almanzo had an illness that left him with a limp, making it difficult for him to farm as he had previously. August 10, 1889, Laura and Almanzo's baby boy died shortly after his birth. Rose remembered that her mother never wanted to talk about this. That was her way of dealing with grief. Shortly after the baby's death, Rose was trying to help by feeding the stove with hay sticks, perhaps similar to what Laura and her and Pa had made in the long winter. Some of them caught fire and, lo and Rose immediately dropped them to the kitchen floor, which caught fire and burned the house completely. Laura managed to get herself and Rose out of the house before it burned down. Almanzo built a small shanty for them to live in as they worked to sell their land and farm animals. They decided to return to Minnesota, but this time to be near Almanzo's family. They remained there a year, but decided to return to South Dakota and then take a train to Westville, Florida. Laura's cousin, Peter, had encouraged them to come, but his wife and neighbors were not welcoming and Laura and Rose were very unhappy. So they took the train back to South Dakota. What happened in this time? Well, their house burned, hail and drought caused crops failure, Almanzo's illness, they lost their baby, and feeling unwelcome as they traveled on. Life was not always happy. Um, in 1894, they moved to Mansfield, Missouri, a trip that took six weeks. Their new home was in Southwest Missouri's Ozarks, an area known as the land of the big red apple for its prosperous orchards. They bought 40 acres and named their farm Rocky Ridge because of the rocks. It is east of Mansfield, Missouri. They added more land until they owned 200 acres. Almanzo and Lara were active in Mansfield, but Rose wanted to live in a bigger place, so she moved to Louisiana with Almanzo's sister Eliza, an editor. By 1930, Rose became an author, uh, writing for magazines, editing for magazines and newspapers. In fact, she became an advertisement for Laura, an advisor critic, I'm sorry, for Laura's books. This, and this was agreeable to Laura. Laura began writing uh, part-time for the Missouri Ruralist, a farm magazine that was published weekly. She wrote about uh, raising chickens and had a column, as a farm woman thinks. What writing challenges did Laura's first attempts were not accepted, so she changed her style of writing and audience the books were intended for, and her books were widely accepted. In 1930, Laura began her first autobiography. Pioneer Girl was her first book about pioneer life for adults, but no one wanted it. She wrote a picture book for children. No one wanted it. An editor suggested that she write books for middle grade students about pioneer life. She wrote about herself as the young girl in Little House in the Big Woods. The year the family lived in Iowa was never mentioned in her books. Her life at Rocky Ridge never changed once she became a successful author. She still did farm jobs in pioneer style, churned butter, sewed and canned food from the garden for winter eating. She would get up in the middle of the night to jot down an idea and stay up writing for hours. Um, interesting tidbits about the Little House books. The themes of Laura's books were family, love, courage, independence, and cheerfulness. In 1922, Little House, 1932, Little House in the Big Woods was published when Laura was 65 years old. In 1943, Those Happy Golden Years was published when she was 76. The Newbery Medal is awarded annually by the American Library Association for the most distinguished American children's book published the previous year. Five of her books were named Newbery Honor Books. In 1938, On the Banks of Plum Creek received the award. 1940, By the Shores of Silver Lake. 1941, The Long Winter. 
1942, the little town on the prairie, 1944, those happy golden years. Laura's books were translated into Braille for the Blind, but she never accepted fees for these books in honor of her sister Mary, who was left blind when she was a young girl. Helen Sewell was the original uh, illustrator of the Little House books, but Garth Williams became the illustrator for Laura's books after they became bestsellers. Have the Little House books ever stirred up controversy? First, first thought may be, why of course not? Well, think again. In a June 25th, 1918, 2018 article, we learned that a division of the American Library Association uh, voted unanimously to strip Laura Ingalls Wilder's name from a major children's literature award over concerns about how the author referred to Native Americans and Blacks. The, uh, the Association for Library Services for Children says the Laura Ingalls Wilder Award will now be known as the Children's Literature Legacy Award. Wilder was first uh, the first recipient of the award, which was established in 1954 and intended to honor books published in the United States that have had a big impact on children's literature. While many of the Little House books became widely read, critics said her work included many stereotypes and reductive depictions of Native Americans and people of color. In 19... 35's Little House on the Prairie, for example, Wilder described one setting once at a place where there were no people, only Indians lived there. That description was changed in later editions of the book. The decision was made in consideration of the fact that her legacy, as represented by her body of work, includes expressions of stereotypical attitudes inconsistent with the ALSC's core values of inclusiveness, integrity, and respect, and responsiveness. They said in a statement following the vote that uh, the anti-Native and anti-Black sentiment, they objected to that in her writing. However, some Wilder scholars see this differently. They say the author's work should not be downplayed. Instead, they say it should be scrutinized and taken as an opportunity to inform children of a context surrounding it. Um, another comment is we believe it is not uh, beneficial to the body of literature to sweep away her name as though her perspectives in her books never existed. Those perspectives are teaching moments to show generations to come how the past was and how we as a society must move forward with a more inclusive and diverse perspective. I must admit that as, as I read, that I read right over the negative reference to Indians on, in the little, little house on the prairie. However, However, I, I stopped, it, stopped, stopped dead in my tracks, so to speak, when I realized that Paul and some of the men of the town came into a literary, a Friday night uh, entertainment cultural event in South Dakota in the, the little town on the prairie, dressed in costumes and with black face, masking, black face masking their, making fun of black people. And I, I was just shocked at that, thinking, well, as we now know, there's nothing new under the sun. This went on years ago. So how do we deal with this kind of thing in literature written in the 18, 1930s and 40s? Laura was depicting life as it existed in the 1880s with attitudes and actions acceptable then. Can this be a time for us to educate ourselves about how attitudes and times have changed. If we completely delete every reference to something that offends a person or a group, we will soon have no history or literature to educate ourselves either. One last thing 
Before we close, Laura Ingalls Wilder was honored by having her bust placed in the Hall of Famous Missourians in the Missouri State Capitol in Jefferson City, Missouri in 1993. We gladly claim her as not only a trailblazer, but also as a famous Missourian. As we close, I hope you realize that Laura Ingalls Wilder was just as human as any of us. She and her family faced natural disasters, grasshopper invasion, blizzards, illnesses, house fires, fear, and uncertainty. They made mistakes when they unintentionally moved into the land intended for the Osage Indians, and when Laura's writing, years after her books were published, stirred up controversy. Many people today can relate to these trying circumstances because we too have faced illness, disease, disasters, fear, and uncertainty. But we too can say, as the Ingalls and Wilder families often said, all's well that ends well. That was great, Anna. Now we're gonna open it up for some questions or comments. I do have a couple questions for you here, Anna. One is, why did you not include Farmer Boy in your program? Okay, I did not include Farmer Boy because in preparing this with the number of books I had to cover, I thought my, we might still be here tonight after supper. <laughs> okay, the second question I have for you is, what can you tell us about Laura's first exam or test to get her teacher's certificate? Okay, at the time she took her first test, she was 15. And a teacher was not supposed to start teaching until they were 16. Fortunately for Laura, the person who was doing the testing was Mr. Bouchy, the man who hired her and also that he and his wife was where she lived. He never thought to ask her about her age. Okay, have a few questions that are coming in on the chat. Do you have a favorite Little House book? No, that's not fair. They're all Laura's children. <laughs> <laughs> no, I really don't. Okay, uh, did Laura's parents live with any of their children towards the end of their life? Uh, the best I can determine, they moved into Dismet, you know, in their later years. I am not sure whether they, I'm, I'm not, I hate to answer that for sure. I don't think they did, but I could be mistaken. Somebody might go to Dismet visiting this summer and find out I'm wrong. Okay, someone wants to know how important was Rose's editing? Well, it was probably very important. I would guess Laura trusted her and you know was, was willing to let her do the editing. Uh, I think Laura would, would defer to Rose's choices in what needed to be edited because she respected her uh, talent. Okay. Uh, the next question I have for you is, what states faced the grasshopper invasion in the 1870s? Excuse me, what? What states faced the grasshopper invasion in the 1870s? Oh, the Dakotas, uh, Kansas, Missouri. If you come to our museum and go, to, go look at our timeline down in the history wing of the museum, you, you will see that Missouri had it too. Uh, but I would say Dakotas, I know Kansas, um, Missouri, I'm not sure, and possibly Iowa, but I do know the four I named. Okay. And do you know if there is still a school for the blind in Vinton, Iowa? Uh, just so happens there is not. What has happened there is um, they, it was known as the Iowa Braille and Sight Saving School that it opened in 1852 as the Iowa College for the Blind. Mary Ingalls uh, attended there, well, she graduated there in 1889. As of the fall of 2011, there is not a residential school for the blind in Iowa, or really, I don't think in 
in quite a few states. Okay. Mary wants to know what was the last book, what year was the last book she wrote? What year? Um, yeah. It'd be 1943. I excuse the paper shuffling. I'm sorry. Uh, 1944, those happy golden years. Okay. And then a follow up question about the grasshopper invasion. Were they actually grasshoppers or were they cicadas? They were, they were identified as grasshoppers. And I really never did any research about the grasshoppers. You know, sometimes the honest truth is just all you can give. Um, Lauren would like to know, why do you think these books have such an enduring appeal? They are family oriented. Um, I think people really search for a family that is close and supportive, that the, the children are taught to work, to love each other, to respect the parents. And I even see this as an example of parents who don't just give their children something to do, but they interact with them. Uh, they talk with them, not to them. In other words, the parents listen as well as talk. Do you know when Rose passed away? In, okay, wait a minute. Laura passed away in the 1950s. Rose passed away in the 1960s. I've read it, but I never thought about it. Uh, sometime in the 1960s, I believe. 1968? Possibly. Okay. Uh, also, have you been to Laura Ingalls Wilder's home there in Mansfield? Have you yes, I have. Anything? Yes, it's a good place to visit. And do you know if there are any direct descendants that are connected with the museum itself or, or anything like that? Um, I don't know that there are. I have a personal question for you. I wanted to know what was the most interesting thing you discovered about Laura that you didn't know before. Oh, that I did not know before. Uh, she, she really was a vibrant person. She had a lot of interest uh, in things. She, she was really a go-getter when she wanted, you know, when she was writing or even as a child growing up, she was, uh, she was interested in things around her and people. Do we have any other questions? What made you interested in her? Having been a librarian, I thought, oh, this will be, this will be a real good program to do. I didn't realize it, but also live with it for many months <laughs> because I reread, I did not read all of Farmer Boy. When I started, I thought, wait a minute, I'm going to have more than I know what to do with. So I read part of Farmer Boy, but I read or reread all of Laura's books. I've read three biographies. I've been on the internet a lot. <laughs> So I don't know if it shows or not, but there's been a lot of effort put into the program today. It does. Now, she passed away before the TV show. What, yes. year, what year did those, do you remember what year those, that series got started? I don't know, but I know it was in Walnut Grove. I did a quick search. It looks like... Uh, uh, it premiered in 1974, September of 1974. Okay. Uh, in a note I see here, you're right. <laughs> and then um, it, was, it was a great program. Uh, can you recommend a good biography of Laura? 
Uh, there's one by Zochart. It's called Lara. It's Z-O-C-H-A-R-T. It's not new by any means, but you can get it at your local public library. You could probably also order it, I imagine. Okay. Any last questions that we have for Anna? Do we have any? If they don't, can I add something? Oh, sure. Feel free to. Go ahead. Okay. Anna. I thought somebody might be interested in this. There are five, one, two, three, four, four, maybe. Laura Ingalls Wilder, oh no, five museums that you can visit. There's one in Pepin, Wisconsin, the Laura Ingalls Wilder Museum. De Smith, South, De Smith, South Dakota, the Laura Ingalls Wilder Historic Homes and Discovery Center. Walnut Grove, Minnesota, the Laura Ingalls Wilder Museum. Mansfield, Missouri, of course, the Laura Ingalls Wilder Historic Home and Museum. And in Independence, Kansas, Little House on the Prairie. One more thing. If anybody is really interested, there are actually two Laura Ingalls Wilder pageants that go on. And if you just look up Google Laura Ingalls Wilder pageant, you can get two of these. Um, one in Walnut Grove will be celebrating its 44th year this summer. And the shows there that are live are July 9th and 10th and 16th and 17th. Those are both weekends. But another one that I have actually forgotten I have a connection to in DeSmet, South Dakota, this year they are celebrating the 50th anniversary of the pageant there. It will be July 9, 10, and 11, 16, 17, and 18, 23, 24, and 25. I don't know about how many years this has been true, but this year's story will be called Prairie Patchwork. Now, remember, I said it's been going on. This will be its 50th year. Sometime in the 1970s, I spent part of a summer in Huron, South Dakota. And we say it Huron because we're south and we say things slower. If you're in South Dakota, Huron is Huron and DeSmet is DeSmet. I guess it's because of cold winters. I don't know why. But anyway, in the summer of probably 1977 or 78, I spent part of that summer in here in South Dakota for uh, something called the Christian Service Corps of a, a Southern Baptist a Home Mission Board. It's now the North American Mission Board. While I was there that summer, there was a couple there from Texas. They knew what I didn't. The lady, the wife, was a fourth grade teacher. They had a motor home and they said, you know, we're going over to dismiss this weekend to see the pageant, do you wanna go? I said, sure. So on Saturday evening, we went to DeSmit. It's really not that many miles away. Um, and we, when we got there, this, you know, in the seventies, they didn't have a lot of eating establishments. They had a, tra a campground for the camper. So the churches at that time, each weekend, they would take turns having a public meal. Now we paid. So we went to church and had supper. And then we went out southeast of town to the homestead where they had bleachers wooden bleachers like at a baseball diamond and we sat out there watching a reenactment of the long winter now this was in july but the fun part of this is the longer the pageant got the colder it got we laughed and said it felt like we were part of the long winter in fact there was a bus of college students there and they were getting cold too. Somebody remembered that they had a package of trash bags on the bus. So they headed to the bus, grabbed the trash bags and cut holes in the top and slid them over their heads and came back to the bleachers. So that's my story. <laughs> but by the way, it is a fam both of those are family friendly shows that as I say, just go on the internet and look up the Laura Ingalls Wilder pageants and you can get more details. So go, take your family and go. That's fabulous. Lauren, do you have any questions for Anna? 
I don't think so. I'll just point people to the the uh, chat that some people have shared a few other places to see in Malone, New York, the Wilder Farm. And then there's also um, a home site in New York on the farm that Almanzo grew up on and they offer tours at the home in the barn. So there's lots of um, Laura Ingalls Wilder type uh, visits and tours that you can do. Okay, thank you, Lauren. Oh, Anna, we want to thank you again for sharing your time and expertise with us this afternoon. We want to invite everyone to check out our website as well as uh, for the past Trailblazer, Trailblazer events. If you go to our website, you'll notice it's under recently live heading on that page, as well as the Missouri State Museum's website page. Join us next month for July's event, like I said. And we thank you all for being with us today and that we wish you a good rest of your day. Thank you very much, everyone.